Hello and welcome to another class of Atmos 620. Uh, this is the third class on atmospheric radiation. I hope you're enjoying the journey. Um, so um, last couple of classes we started talking about uh, radiation. We introduced some basic concepts and, um, and we started sort of zooming in on molecules and, and what's going on at the micro scale or the quantum scale, to use a better word. Um, today, we will dig a little deeper on, uh, particularly on spectra. We'll talk about spectra, not so much on a sort of an abstract level, uh, the way we did last time, but on a more practical level. Um, well, more pra it's arguable whether it's practical or not, but more useful for uh, for our curriculum, and we'll talk about uh, solar spectra and the role of um, the atmosphere in um, in that. So why don't we just get started? Um, okay, so first of all, um, just uh, as a reminder, uh, this is a solar spectrum, okay, meaning the uh, sort of the power, if you will, that reaches um, the planet, okay? The continuous line is the top of the atmosphere. The dashed regions here is the, uh, the surface. And this dashed line here is kind of what you'd expect, okay? Given the temperature of the sun. The uh, y-axis is what we call irradiance. So watts per meter square per uh, nanometer. So at a particular uh, frequency, what is the uh, power that is given to an area, um, either the top of the atmosphere or the surface, and the x-axis is the wavelength is given in nanometers, okay? Uh, and <clears throat> what we're showing here, this is a spectrum um, that uh, is very, I mean, you can see it's kind of different from the spectra that we saw um, I don't remember if it was last class or a couple of classes ago, but if you remember when I showed, I think it was a couple of classes ago when I showed the, I showed the hydrogen spectrum in the visible part, and uh, you know there was the spectrum, and you had just a bunch of lines, right? And the spectrum was black, and the lines were um, uh, were colored, okay, and. Uh, the colors corresponded to the wavelength of the photons um, <clears throat> that is emitted for a particular transition. Um, so this is an emission spectrum, meaning that you put a gas or whatever and you heat it up, you put it in a box, you heat it up, and you make it emit, right? It emits a light, you observe a light, you put it, you let it go under through a prism, uh, and when I say light, I mean this uh, pretty liberally, like could be, you know, ultraviolet or infrared, um, infrared spectrum or whatnot. This is what we call an absorption spectrum. And it's kind of the opposite, okay? Um, in this case, uh, I I think this, I want to say this, Chris, this is, Forgetting the details. I think this is the absorption spectrum of sodium, but don't quote me on that. It's not relevant for the class. I should have written it down, nevertheless. Um, and um, what what does that mean? Well, this is the opposite. So in this case, there was the gas, you know, the gas that was shining lights, and you were observing this light. In this case, you have a black body you know, um, like, yeah, and it's some kind of an idealized black body that is emitting everywhere, okay? And here you put a gas, and here you observe, you capture the light that shines through, and you let it go through a prism, and that's what you obtain. So here the light was emitted from the gas, here the dark, um, lines are absorbed is photons that are absorbed by the gas as the light passes through it so it's kind of 
it contains the same amount of information. It's just a different way to do this. The reason why I say that this is sodium, and again, I could I could be completely wrong, but sodium um, is known to have two uh, yellow lines that are very close to each other. Uh, and that's how I kind of remembered it. Uh, but again, not relevant. Um, but anyway. Um, okay, so this is an absor absorption spectrum. And if you will, this these are also kind of absorption spectra, right? This is the spectrum that is emitted. The dash line is the spectrum that is emitted from a black body, which is the sun, or we idealize it as a, as a black body. And um, then some of it goes through some uh, interstellar gas. This could be uh, the, um, the outer layers of the sun. Uh, I think they're called the coronas, uh, or the corona of the sun. Uh, and so some of it is absorbed there. Uh, some of it is absorbed by the outer layers of the atmosphere. When I say top of the atmosphere, we mean a point that is really, really high but the atmosphere doesn't really have a top. So there will be some absorption, right? And same here, except that here there's even more absorption, right? And so notice that um, here there are all these dips and these dips are essentially, they correspond to these uh, dark lines, if you will, right? That would be another way of representing it. Uh, and these are entirely due to absorption within um, the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so, uh, you could kind of approximate this as a black body radiation. And this corresponds to the radiation, the spectrum of a black body that is approximately at, um, at, um, 5,800, uh, Kelvin degrees. Uh, and that is uh, the reason why, why we have that is that, uh, that is the, um, outer, uh, the temperature of the outer layers of um, of the sun. Uh, the sun by itself is uh, made seventy five percent by uh, it's made seventy five percent is hydrogen and about twenty five percent is um, helium. Okay. Um, now this is not surprising. Um, this. Partition is not surprising because um, because um, that's essentially the composition of the universe, if you will. Uh, most of the matter in the universe is hydrogen, about 75% is hydrogen, 25% is helium, roughly, and everything else is in much, much smaller proportions. Okay, so anything you encounter in the universe, it's either hydrogen or helium you know, or at least chances are. Um, heavier elements are, this is a tricky word, synthesized in the core of the stars. So, um, but they're a bit more rare, okay? Uh, in our case, um, the iron, the carbon, the oxygen, the carbon in your bones, the oxygen that you breathe and the nitrogen that you breathe, all that was formed inside of a star that existed before the sun. You know, at the beginning of the universe, there was a star, presumably, and this star, in the core of the star, heavy elements were produced. At some point, the star kind of died, and the new star that was formed uh, already contained some of these heavier elements. And when the star, uh, the new star was born, the sun, uh, these heavier elements were kind of blown out by, you know, at the moment that the star was born, that the sun was born. Heavier elements clearly didn't travel much because they were heavier. And so the planets in the inner core of the solar system, like Mercury, Mars, Venus, Earth, they're a bit heavier because they contain all these heavy elements that couldn't travel much. Neptune, Neptune, uh, Uranus, uh, Jupiter, they all contain a lot of lighter elements. Pluto is kind of a story, you know, it's not even a planet anymore, but it probably has different origin than, than the solar system. Um, anyway, this is a long detour just to say, it kind of makes sense that 
the sun has this composition. And that also means that the sun is kind of a has kind of a similar, it's kind of a simple structure, right? Because it only contains these very, very simple gases, it mostly contains these very, very simple gases. Um, the, um, right, so these absorption lines are sometimes, just to fix some nomenclature, these are sometimes known as uh, Fraunhofer lines. And uh, they are due, these guys here, they're due to absorption in the various layers of the sun, okay? So you should imagine that much like the Earth has an atmosphere that doesn't really have an end, you know, a fixed end, also the sun doesn't really have like an outer layer, right? It's a big ball of gas. And so it has some kind of a fuzzy outer layer and a fuzzy outer outer layer and the corona, which is like an even fuzzier stuff. And all this contains a lot of gas and this gas can, can absorb some of the radiation that is emitted uh, from the sun. Uh, this should not be news to you, but this is the composition of our atmosphere. We usually say, oh, you know, we breathe oxygen, but you should know by now that oxygen is actually toxic. And uh, if you breathe too much oxygen, and that's not good for you. But luckily for us, uh, oxygen only makes up about 21% of our atmosphere, most of which is nitrogen, okay? Um, argon is also um, relatively abundant compared to other gases. Uh, we do have, luckily, some water vapor. And everything else is kind of, um, you know, in smaller proportions. CO2, uh, this is probably an old figure, it's 0.036%, or stated otherwise, 360 parts per million. Uh, I forgot the last count, but I think we are uh, beyond 400 parts per million of CO2, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, CO2, as we will see, has enormous consequences on the radiative budget, budget uh, of, um, of our planet. Okay? There are also, interestingly enough, there are also some chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, in the atmosphere. These are present in very, very small proportions, but uh, CFCs uh, can actually harm the ozone layer. Uh, these are small proportions, but also so is ozone, uh, which is, you know, parts per billion even. Um, and ozone is important because, as we'll see today, uh, ozone captures ultraviolet radiation. So most of you probably weren't born um, in the you know end of 80s or 90s but uh, the ozone hole was a big thing at the time and uh, we discovered that um, one of the responsible for the destruction of the ozone hole of the ozone layer were these chlorofluorocarbons that were contained in a lot of products that we actually used um, i remember at some point in my uh, youth uh, hairspray was banned because it contained chlor it contains CFCs, okay, that could harm um, the ozone layer. Um, and now it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a given that we shouldn't use these products, but back in the, you know, back in the days, it was a little bit of a controversy. I wouldn't say it was the same controversy as um, the controversy around climate change, but certainly, um, yeah, there was some controversy related to that. Okay, so uh, let's zoom in on the uh, solar spectrum. Um, this is, uh, as we said, the irradiance near the surface, okay? So what actually arrives at the surface, right? And um, there's a couple of things that we want to notice. Um, first thing, wavelengths increase going that way, right? And given that uh, there's an inverse relationship with frequency, so that frequency is speed of light over wavelength, <clears throat> and speed of light is constant. Um, frequency is also energy, and so H C over lambda should tell you something about the energy contained in photons of a given uh, wavelength. Going down this way, if you go this way, the energy goes down. Okay, energy goes down. Okay, so these are low energy um, photons, high energy photons. 
whenever you, you hear high energy photons, you should think uh, dangerous. Okay, this is the visible spectrum, infrared, and ultraviolet. Notice that there is a huge gap near the peak here in the visible. There's a huge uh, gap here, and there's also a significant gap. Notice that uh, irradiance drops almost to zero below uh, 400 nanometers. Okay, this is blue, this is kind of violet ish. Actually, this drop here and the fact that the spectrum goes down so rapidly is possibly one of the reasons why the sky is blue and not violet, right? Because, well, we'll see it, but keep this in mind. Um, but it's also good because this, all this is dangerous stuff. The radiation that would come down in this part of the spectrum would be really, really dangerous for us and particularly for our skins. Um, ultraviolet radiation causes um, skin cancer. And, but luckily this is almost down to zero and the uh, sort of the hero that's responsible for this is precisely ozone. Okay, and that is why we were so alarmed back in the days uh, when we said, um, when we noticed that there was a hole in the Antarctic region um, in the ozone layer. The ozone layer is kind of higher up in the stratosphere, so not something that we could affect um, that could be affected by the weather, but you know, some gases eventually are injected in the stratosphere. As we go to higher uh, wavelengths, to greater to lower energies, uh, then other gases start to become important. And most notably, oxygen has some role. Water vapor is a very important absorber, and also CO2, okay? Um, another way to display this information is to show it like this, where all the spectrum is normalized to one. Um, now, Instead of just focusing on one tiny part of the spectrum, which was, this was between 200 and um, uh, nanometers, 200 nanometers and 1,000 nanometers, so this would be 1.6 one mic micrometers, which is roughly here, I think. This is what we could see in the previous plot. This now goes all the way down to uh, three centimeters, which is pretty wide. One good reason to normalize everything to one is that, as you can see here, um, the Planck's function drops down quite substantially. And so if you were to compare absolute values here at the peak with absolute values um, at lower energies, it would be really hard to appreciate uh, variations. Uh, and so that's one good reason to normalize everything to one. And again, notice that uh, H2O uh, appears in uh, a lot of spaces. This is a big, big infrared window where uh, water vapor kind of absorbs everything. Uh, CO2 is also important. Um, and uh, oxygen and water vapor are somehow important in the microwave um, part of the spectrum. This is almost like radio level. Okay, so uh, what are then the primary absorbers in, in the atmosphere? So we kind of distinguish between those uh, that absorb a lot in the ultraviolet and in general in shorter wavelengths. Uh, and these would be oxygen and ozone. All, they're all oxygen molecules. Uh, usually oxygen likes to form um, a bond with another oxygen molecule. Uh, pardon me, with another oxygen atom, so that oxygen normally is present as a diatomic molecule made of two um, oxygen atoms. But occasionally it will form sort of a bond with um, between three oxygen atoms. It's not, um, it's not very easy to form ozone and it requires absorption of photons and some weird photo dissociation that happens in the stratosphere, but it happens, okay? Um, and ozone is, as we will see, primarily confined to the uh, sort of outer, outer layers of the atmosphere. Uh, methane, actually, is a strong absorber in the infrared bands. Um, most, um, it's, well, methane is particularly active at 
uh, about 3 micrometers, 3.31, and at 7.63 uh, micrometers, which we can see here, CH4 and CH4 band and band here due to methane. Actually, methane is, I believe, a stronger absorber than CO2, uh, but luckily methane is present in uh, is less affected by uh, global warming, if you will, uh, by the increase of greenhouse gases. And uh, then we have uh, CO2. <clears throat> I mean, CO2 is kind of notably a big absorber and, you know, all the big absorber in the infrared. So CO2 and methane and we will see water vapor. These are strong absorbers in the infrared, meaning long wave radiation, typically. <clears throat> and um, these absorb a lot um, also in the solar spectrum um, CO2 in 2.5, 4.3 and 15 micrometers and the absorption spectra due to CO2 they can be pretty complicated um, you can see the main ones here um, 2.7 uh, then here and uh, there was on here, yeah. Uh, these absor absorption lines are due to CO2 in the atmosphere. And then finally, water vapor. Uh, water vapor also absorbs at 2.7 micrometers and at 6.3 micrometers. These are the strong, or the sort of the strongest bands, absorption bands. Um, now, CO2 and methane are kind of present a little bit everywhere. And same as H2O, uh, or water vapor, except that water vapor has uh, a good degree of variability um, within the atmosphere and um, its concentration is sensitive to uh, the latitude, it's sensitive to the season. And one reason why seasonality and uh, geographical location are kind of uh, big influence, well, play, they exert a strong influence on H2O is that H2O, unlike these other gases. H2O can undergo phase transitions on Earth uh, at conditions that happen on Earth. Of course CO2 and methane also undergo phase transition. On some planets it rains methane, right, and it rains CO2 and whatever. But uh, transition to, well, the um, the um, the uh, solidification temperature is much lower than the conditions that are met uh, on Earth and or require a stronger pressure than, than is achieved um, that is achieved on Earth. And so that is why uh, this is distribution of the sky here is more sensitive to um, position and, uh, and speed. Okay. So we can break down uh, a little bit more. We can break down the absorptions uh, of H2O. And uh, here we're focusing on um, sort of the uh, infrared part of the spectrum, okay? And uh, uh, in particular, this is all the absorption spectrum. And this is the uh, part of the spectrum that is due to H2O, okay? This is uh, again, kind of restating some of the things that I said earlier, but breaking down different parts of the spectrum that are due of the absorption spectrum that are due to the different gases. Okay. Um, um, anyway, uh, so so this is the uh, line the absor the absorption spectrum that we care about. Um, we talk about atmospheric window, which is this part of the spectrum where absorption is mostly weak. And uh, here, photons can travel kind of undisturbed. Uh, but however, if you move either to the right or to the left, there are strong absorption lines due to, in one case, to CO2, but also H2O kind of absorbs a lot in this region, and uh, to the left. Uh, it's mostly um, H2O here. Now, the molecule of water vapor is asymmetric and it has uh, both rotational and vibrational modes. 
In particular, it has three fundamental modes of vibration, and uh, these are associated with um, the absorption at sort of a higher frequencies or lower uh, wavelengths, okay? It's not important that we understand what new one, new two, and new three is. Just keep in mind that these are mostly vibrational uh, modes or vibrational effects um, that correspond to these uh, absorption lines here. Uh, rotation becomes important at lower energies. So over here, rotation kind of becomes a more important phenomenon. Uh, in terms of CO2, now uh, CO2 is kind of different because H2O has uh, an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. And I believe the angle here is something like uh, 180 degrees, if I am not mistaken. But CO2, on the other hand, has a carbon atom and then has an oxygen atom on one side, oxygen atom on the other side. So it's a linear molecule. Okay, It's not as weird looking as uh, water vapor. And so because of this symmetry, it doesn't have a permanent electric dipole moment, which means that it doesn't have a rotation band. Okay. Uh, however, uh, there can still be vibrational modes, okay? Um, and vibration could be that, you know, maybe oxygen atoms oscillate in this direction, or it could be that oxygen atoms oscillate in this direction and C goes in that direction, sort of in opposite directions. Uh, the most important absorption band for CO2 is here at about 50 micrometers in this region here. Okay, You can see that there are some lines at higher energies, but this is a big, big uh, line. Um, and this is a bending mode at 15 micrometers. Stretching vibrations, which correspond to, um, to the bending mode, is what I'm erasing now. Uh, stretching vibration, which are these guys, are responsible for the band at uh, 4.3 micrometers here. Um, next in line is uh, ozone, and uh, ozone here, you can see that it has a strong absorption at about uh, 10 micrometers, 9.6 uh, to be a bit more precise, so here, and it also shows up in the total uh, spectrum here in the uh, atmospheric window. It is kind of the main and almost the only gas that absorbs uh, in the atmospheric window. There are some rotational modes for the water vapor molecule, for the water molecule, but um, you know the one that causes real damage is uh, is kind of uh, is kind of here. Okay. Okay. Now uh, let me drink a glass of water. Okay, so uh, apart from ultra uh, from infrared absorption, there's there is also ultraviolet absorption, and um, <clears throat> things in the ultraviolet are a little bit different than um, than the infrared. In the ultraviolet, the kind of um, the kind of um, transitions that happen or the kind of modes. Uh, or the kind of photons um, that can happen are different from um, from just rotational and vibrational modes, but we can also have things like um, ionization or photodissociation, okay? <clears throat> and so sometimes instead of having a discrete spectrum, we can have a whole continuum, right? Um, the reason why we have a continuum is that, if you remember, when we talked about um, quantum mechanics and all the different modes, we said, well, there's a nucleus in the hydrogen atom, for example. Uh, there's uh, orbitals, and at some point an electron jumps from one layer to the other, and it emits a photon with the right frequency that corresponds to this transition, right? And if an electron wants to jump, it has to absorb a photon that has exactly the right kind of frequency. Now, um, this has to be exact and quantized, okay? Like the photons need to have the right frequency uh, to do this jump. However, if you are breaking up 
a bond, for example, between two molecules. Um, you could absorb a, a photon, for example, but once you absorb the photon, the photon doesn't need to have exactly the same energy as this bond. The photon could have slightly more energy and the additional energy that is not used to break up this, uh, this bond here, this additional energy is um, given to these atoms as uh, kinetic energy, okay? And so you're going from, you know, having a spectrum where you just have these dips, if you're looking at the absorption spectrum, then you can have a whole continuum, okay? And that's why we don't talk so much about, um, we don't talk so much about irradiance and we don't look at spectra the same kind of the same way, uh, but we talk about, um, for these kinds of uh, transitions, we use a concept that is uh, the, cr the cross-section that we encounter uh, before. Now, if you remember, when we talked about, <clears throat> when we talked about um, microphysics, we defined the cross-section as essentially the area that you see, as, uh, the area of the target that you see as you approach the target. Okay, so you're approaching the target and the target is a ball of radius r, the, the area that you see in front of you is a two-dimensional object and it has an area pi r squared, okay? This is kind of obvious. In the quantum world, however, things are a little bit more complicated than you, it's not necessary that you have uh, like a physical object like this that is kind of hard and then you hit it like two balls. Uh, usually you have an area of influence and so there is an atom here and atoms are really almost point-like objects but um, there are um, let's say there's a particle or photon that is traveling if the photon is far enough then it doesn't see this atom but if it gets close enough this photon might actually get absorbed okay and so even though uh, there isn't really anything physical uh, stopping the photon. It's as if the photon had hit a wall, okay, once it gets absorbed here. And so this area of influence of an atom or a particle we call cross-section, okay? So it's kind of the same idea, um, but in the quantum world, things get a little bit fuzzy. And uh, the absorption cross-section is kind of the effective area within which uh, absorption happens. And if you will, it, it can be related to the probability of, of absorption, okay? And this can be related to uh, an absorption cross-section and uh, the molecular mass of the particular gas that is involved in the, um, in the absorption. Now, Unlike for the infrared part, where we mainly have rotational and vibrational modes, now we can also have other kinds of transitions. We can have electronic transitions, we can have ionization um, effects or transitions. The reason why we have to include these is because electronic transitions, photo dissociation and stuff like that, photo ionization, uh, dissociation is when you break up a molecule, ionization is when you kick out an electron from an atom or a molecule. The reason why we need to include these now is because uh, the energies that correspond to these kinds of transitions are a lot higher than rotational and vibrational transitions. And so once you go to a higher energy part of the spectrum, you need to include, include those as well. Okay. Okay, excellent. For uh, oxygen, for example, this is, you could think of this as kind of the spectrum, if you will. Okay, uh, this is the logarithm in base 10 of the cross section. Okay, and uh, this is as a function of wavelength. And this shows uh, essentially the different, um, the different parts of the spectrum that correspond to different absorption uh, of uh, oxygen, okay? Uh, at uh, lower wavelengths, we have what we call Hertzberg continuum here between um, roughly 200 and 250 nanometers. Between 150 and 200 nanometers, these are called Schumann-Runge bands, okay? 
and these are really like absorption bands, if you will, then for between roughly 120 and 170 nanometers, there's the Schumann-Runge continuum. And then uh, as we go to higher and higher energy, here we start to have photoionization effects, okay? And there's an ionization continuum from about uh, 100 nanometers uh, lower. You don't have to remember all the different bands, but just keep in mind that this is the way that information is represented often um, for ultraviolet absorbers. And these are, you know, kind of what it looks like um, at these, um, at these uh, frequencies. This is kind of what I said. Uh, the uh, photo dissociation that uh, happens uh, in, I think, uh, here in the Schumann-Runge uh, continuum, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe that it happens uh, here. The kind of transition that happens is that a molecule of oxygen, okay, breaks in to two different atoms of oxygen, but these atoms are in different atomic configuration, okay? Meaning that uh, one atom has the standard configuration of oxygen that you'd find in nature, well, that you'd find, yeah, normally. This is the lowest possible energy, but um, one, the other, has an excited, uh, is in a, is, the other is in an excited state, meaning that one of the electrons is on a higher energy level compared to this, which is the ground state. So this has the minimum possible energy associated with it. This has slightly more energy, okay? And this slightly more energy is, uh, is possible because of the higher um, sort of energy content associated with these uh, transitions. Um, okay, so here, as we were saying, this is ionization that happens here. Um, and uh, between, yeah, so the Hertzberg continuum is, to, is associated with a photo dissociation into two oxygen atoms, but they're both on a ground state. So here you're at a lower energy. Here in the Schumann-Runge continuum, one is in the ground state, the other is in the um, excited state. Here, both atoms are on, a gr on the ground state, you have, which kind of makes sense because they're both on the, uh, I mean, this is lower energy compared to this, and so it makes sense that you'd find uh, two ground states and one excited state here. Okay, in terms of uh, ozone, uh, ozone has kind of three major absorption bands, uh, and I'm showing them here. Uh, we have the uh, Chapuis band but from 400 nanometers uh, higher. The Huggins band is roughly between 310 and 350 nanometers. And Hartley bands are between 200 and 310 nanometers, roughly here. Okay. Uh, the Hartley band, these kinds of uh, absorption happens <clears throat> in the upper stratosphere, so and in the mesosphere, so we're talking 100 kilometers um, upward, okay, so pretty high in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, the Chapuis absorption here, this tends to happen much lower in the, in the atmosphere, so the lower stratosphere and uh, upper troposphere uh, stratopause, uh, tropopause, I'm sorry. Um, these are typically associated with electronic transitions or uh, photo dissociation types of uh, transitions. Uh, one fun fact, the Chapuis band, um, the photons that are emitted in the Chapuis band are associated with this phenomenon that we call blue hour, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with this, but if you ever, uh, you know, if you ever, if you were ever up before sunrise, um, I don't know, maybe you were like connecting flights or whatever. Um, <clears throat> you notice that before the sun comes out, the sky gets like a very particular and very strange blue color. And uh, that is 
or one of the main responsible for that blue collar is um, our photons that are emitted in the Chapuis band. Okay, and you kind of, it kind of makes sense because these are now starting to be sort of lower energy, um, uh, lower energy, the, you're in the lower energy part of the spectrum. Okay, so it kind of makes sense that this, the photons coming out of here, they would actually be visible. Uh, as opposed to these guys that would be in the ultraviolet. Um, one way that we know that this is the Chapuis band, that this blue is from the Chapuis band and not from the normal blue of the sky that is due to radi um, scattering, is that um, Scattering is, we'll talk about this in a couple of lectures, but scattering tends to uh, do one thing that is to, um, the word I'm looking for, um, tends to polarize radiation, okay? Meaning that uh, photons, the electromagnetic radiation will tend to, the waves will tend to vibrate in a particular direction. Um, and so one way to know whether you know, what you're observing is the blue sky of uh, the radi from radi scattering is to see if the light is polarized or not. Um, if you were to look at the sky with this, uh, at this particular hour, you wouldn't see this polarization, okay? Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, okay, so a uh, final thing that uh, I wanted to say is that um, there are different, I mean, we talked about sort of lower energetic, well, I mean, ultraviolet part of the spectrum and the absorption happens kind of uh, lower in the atmosphere. There's actually, um, if you look at the different, different sort of continuum uh, absorption or the particular bands that you find. Interestingly, these, as you go to greater and greater energies, these tend to happen at higher and higher altitude, okay? So the absorption that happens, uh, for example, at about 550 uh, or 100 nanometer, this tends to happen in the thermosphere, which is about 200 kilometers, okay? Um, and this is pretty much what I kind of wanted to um, to say about this. So yeah, uh, as a result of that, uh, this is kind of lucky. Let me just reiterate this because this is very important. This would be very dangerous radiation if it were to reach the surface. It would be very dangerous for life on Earth. Uh, but luckily, the outer parts of the atmosphere, and this is not trivial at all, but the outer parts of the atmosphere absorb this so that basically no uh, radiation um, from this uh, kind of penetrates, uh, kind of penetrates um, all the way down to the surface. One way to read this is that um, this is, this line represents what uh, we call uh, altitude of unit optical depth, meaning at what altitude is the um, absorption at a particular frequency significant okay there will be there is a way to quantify this but just you know as a sort of a to have an intuitive understanding at what altitude is the absorption at 100 nanometers significant and this tells you that that altitude is about 100 kilometers and as you go lower and lower in energies this is it actually drops down to zero which is good because it means that the visible part of the spectrum actually kind of makes it all the way down to the surface and so we can see. Um, but this dangerous part is absorbed at higher and higher uh, layers in the atmosphere. Okay, uh, this concludes pretty much all I had to say about, uh, about spectra for this class. Um, as usual, let me know if something was unclear. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, see you guys for, um, for our next lecture.